Hey there, everyone. I'm Varn with UCAN. Welcome to UCAN Science. Today, we've got a fantastic guest with us, Dr. Kathy Eckel, to share all of the science and the nuts and bolts of Superstarch, our revolutionary energy source. Kathy, thanks so much for being here with us today. Lovely to be here with you. And Kathy, I want to uh, dive a little bit into your background before we get started. But first, I want to introduce my co-host, Natalie Schneck, joining us as well. Natalie, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Varn. Awesome. Well, Natalie and I are super excited, Kathy, to dive into this topic and get uh, meaty on the science. Uh, we always appreciate um, kind of your perspective here, uh, explaining the science uh, both at a very high level, but simplifying it as well. So I don't want to put Natalie in this camp, so but somebody like myself can understand it. Um, and you're really you know, excited that you're going to be able to do that for our audience. Um, but before we get started, Kathy, you, um, you've been in this nutrition world for a long time. Give us some perspective on your background uh, in nutrition and what you're currently doing today. Sure, so I'm through the Yale School of Public Health and one of the things that I have done over time is work with exercise physiology and research with exercise physiology and, and metabolism. So I'm more on the metabolism side than I'm on the nutrition side, but I've worked with everything from young children and you know, kids that have difficulties with obesity and glucose control, all the way up to um, the older individuals in our society that also have glucose control problems. So I, I've sort of hit the full spectrum of exercise metabolism. Now, with Superstart specifically, um, how did it come on your radar? It was something that you heard about, uh, you know, well before it was commercially available. How did Superstarch come across your radar and, and why did you even pay attention to it? What, what was it that intrigued you at all about trying to learn more about how this worked? Yeah, Superstarch has a, has a great history because when this is a, a great small grassroots company initially. So I heard it about it from a neighbor who is one of the investors. And initially it was like, well, you should you should really pay attention to this special carbohydrate because it works completely differently than every other type of carbohydrate. And I just completely dismissed it. <laughs> and then the person started to talk about the fact that it was, that it, of its history and the fact that it had been produced to help a kid with glycogen storage disease. And then that caught my interest. So to me, it's more about the history and what the super starch can actually do and what, what it's all about, what it is as a carbohydrate that really got my attention. Well, that's a great segue, Kathy, because, um, you know, the history of super starch and, and what it was developed for, which you, you briefly touched on, um, is really part of the story and what makes it so unique, why there's nothing else really like this. Um, so Natalie, take us, take us through the origins of super starch a little bit. Um, what was this developed for? Um, you know, why, why does it even exist? Sure, of course. So this has a great origin story, right? So um, super starch was originally developed for an infant with a life-threatening form of hypoglycemia. Um, and until super starch came about, the only way he could manage his blood sugar levels was by eating every two hours on the clock, around the clock to survive. Uh, so this carbohydrate, the question when people, uh, when researchers were developing this is, how do we get a carbohydrate to deliver glucose slowly and steadily so that he can take a certain amount and sleep eight hours through the night. That's how it came about. Um, so it was initially designed to help uh, manage his blood glucose levels uh, so that he could get eight hours of sleep at night. So there's, hearing that story, you know, that there's something very uh, unique, obviously this was this was developed for for something very uncommon and something very rare and, and, and a very extreme condition. Um, so when we're talking, and uh, however that being said, it was also, something that was being fed to infants originally. So so when we just think about what super starch actually is, you know, it's not, of course, it's not a familiar name. Uh, what is super starch, Kathy? What, what, is, what are we actually talking about here? Yeah, we're talking about a real food. It's a real ingredient, if you will, that's been designed from a um, non-GMO corn that, that is a starch. So when, carbo when you talk about carbohydrates, starches are a, are a really large molecule that have lots and lots, thousands and thousands of glucose units on the starch. And what happens is, is that just through heat 
and cooling and moisture added, they were able to make it so that this starch was very complex and took a very long time for the body's enzymes to, to chip away at it and release their energy. And so it's instead of it being something where uh, the child could last, you know, only two hours or or maybe a little bit longer on, on some of the uncooked, some versions of various um, starches that existed at the time. Super starch is really unique because it can, it has been shown with, with even in adults with glycogen storage disease, these people, just to let you know, these people cannot create their own blood sugar. So they depend on what they eat. This, so it needs to be slow. It has to be able to be just the right amount at the right time. And they, you know, they can take it at night and they can last literally hours. They can last through the night on this eight hours and, and some they've shown even longer. So it's, 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 it's a gift that keeps on giving, so to speak. <laughs> and really, you know, to, to just take what you were just saying, just um, specified to you, Ken, you know, Jonah, whose uh, family was involved with the creation of this, he was able to, you know, take in uh, between 90 and 120 grams of the super starch at varying times and have it last him, you know, up to eight hours. Um, so, so very much kind of validating what you were just talking about. And, um, you know, one of the things I just wanted to also mention is so with super starch, uh, what the UCAN company, the relationship with it is that UCAN has a patent on the cooking technology that's applied to this starch. So for the purpose of what it was developed for, uh, for glycogen storage disease, the non-GMO cornstarch that's the basis of super starch was what was found to work best. When, when that starch was cooked uh, through this proprietary process, that's what provided the best slower and slowest and longest lasting uh, release of energy over several hours. Um, so, so that again is really kind of the background to, to why super starch is uh, made with what it is and, and how it's made as well. Um, so Kathy, now that we know what super starch is, let's talk a little bit about what it does. Um, so we've alluded to, um, you know, some of the, the results in folks with GSD, but taking that now to the next step for, for everyday folks, what is super starch doing metabolically and, and why does it even matter? Okay, so that's a, it's a really good question because I think one of the things that's happened over time is we've sort of vilified carbohydrates mm -hmm. and carbohydrates are a really important, um, huge class of, of, our <laughs> of our macronutrients. You know, there's proteins, there's fats, and there's carbohydrates. But within carbohydrates, there's different qualities of carbohydrate. And what super starch is, is it's one of the large um, polysaccharides. So it's a large, large molecule here. And so what happens is that as you take it in, one, your stomach can can handle this large molecule relatively quickly, and it doesn't pull all sorts of water into the into the intestines along with it. It has a really low, what's called low osmotic pressure. And so what happens is, is that the enzymes can start to chip away at it and slowly release the glucose. And when you slowly release glucose, all of a sudden the pancreas, the, 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 the organ that releases insulin, those beta cells in the pancreas don't have to be don't have to go crazy. It, it basically, the sugar can come on board, the, that sugar, that blood sugar, the glucose can come on board at really low insulin amounts. And that's fantastic for the health of the pancreas. And it's fantastic for all of us because it, it keeps it so that you're basically unaware <laughs> that your sugar is stable. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful in its unawarenessness of it. <laughs> so when we're thinking about what you were just talking about for, for exercise, you know, I think there's been this general notion and even uh, looking at the sports drink industry that the way to keep blood sugar stable is by constantly feeding. But the way you were just describing what super starch does, it's kind of different, right? There's a different tactic. There's a different metabolic methodology, if you will, with how super starch is keeping blood sugar stable versus how, you know, a traditional sports drink we might consume is keeping blood sugar stable. Can you kind of just, just discuss, you know, the relationship or how those might differ? Yeah. So when you talk about the, the quick acting, the fast acting carbohydrates, those are the simple sugar. So if you were to take in some table sugar, if you were to take in the sports drinks, and those are the those are the, the types of sugars that, you know, 20 minutes later, they're on your system and they're, they're, they're hitting pretty hard because they're very difficult to tune in. So more often than not, a simple sugar is going, you're going to overshoot your blood sugar. Your blood sugar is going to go way up and then it's going to come right back down again as the body is forced to deal with this barrage of sugar. 
And instead, if you have super starch and have something come off very slowly, your body can kind of ignore it. And it, it, so it, it's, it's the, the huge difference between within the sports context of we didn't have anything before that you could just take very, very, that could just work on its own. It just comes off in a timed release kind of fashion versus, versus needing to all of a sudden take lots of little doses of simple sugars because you can't dial them in. Now, the other element of super starch, um, as we look at the graph on the screen and, and look at um, the comparison between super starch and maltodextrin, which is a common fast acting carbohydrate, um, you know, the blood sugar response you're seeing would be representative of a simple sugar or, or similar to it, correct? Um, so one element of it is the rate at which the calories are coming in. And another element at, at, or the, the carbohydrate is coming in, another element of what we see on the screen though is that big with the maltodextrin the big up and down in blood sugar that we're not seeing with super starch you know and for for many of us we can identify that as a crash um what what is a blood sugar crash like what we're seeing with maltodextrin what does that mean and, and again uh for for folks that are exercising or even just for for folks who are consuming carbohydrates throughout their day like why don't we want that blue line dropping like we're seeing on the screen well, there's a, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's indicating that the person probably had a very big insulin response. And, they're, and, and so the body is seeing this barrage of nutrients. They're having a big insulin response. And the whole point of that insulin response is to pull that sugar into the muscle and to sort of burn it superfluously, right? So because there's too much there. So it's too many calories, it's, it's overshooting the mark, so to speak. Whereas with the super starch, it's, it's coming on the system so slowly that there isn't a big, there isn't any, you know, there's the real big spike. There's, there's the, it, the enzymes were able to chip away the little outer part. So there's a little bit of a spike, but not much of one. And, and the, the difference then is, is when, when you come down, all of a sudden that crash aspect, when you look at the figure and you see the blue line going down, 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 the body is interpreting that as, oh my gosh, I'm going to become hypoglycemic. And it's going to really trigger a big, big um, response to eat. And, and so if you don't have these big waves in blood sugar, you're much, much less, less likely to to be triggered in terms of hunger. And we've known that for a long time. If you blindfold everybody, don't tell them what the, you know, have them drink and, and don't tell them that their sugars are coming down. And, but you're measuring the sugars, everybody will want to eat when their sugars start to drop. So it's a very real physiological, but it's protection. It doesn't really have anything to do with the calories. It has everything to do with the, the body trying to protect itself from going hypoglycemic. How about the, we, we talked, um, and uh, one more question on this, um, the, the cognitive effect of what we're seeing with that blood sugar crash. What what's happens to folks' minds when blood sugar is going up and down? How might that manifest itself in a practical way in terms of the actions we take if our blood sugar is all over the place? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, how much research has gone into it, but, you know, we know there are very common symptoms of hypoglycemia. People get very angry. They can get, they can have problems even maintaining their body temperature properly. They can, they can be sleepy. They can, you know, there's lots and lots of, it's hard to concentrate. It's, so you lose a lot of your mental capacity. It can be hard to remember things. There, there are lots of various clues that there's a problem, but a lot of it for most of us, the minute our blood sugar starts to crash like that is we get really hungry. Mm -hmm. And so you are going to overeat because you are just, you all of a sudden feel like, wow, I need food right now. And if you don't have that, if you have something like super starts that allows the blood sugar to come off very slowly. So it's very steady energy. You don't even think about food. It's, 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 it's complete opposite. Natalie, one, one for you on this, you know, we're really, talking about this blood sugar issue because it's so core to what super starch does right at, at a foundation uh, the advantage uh, the benefit that super starch is providing is this stability in your blood sugar which with kathy you had just explained why it does that and how it does that um natalie for you um you know having your background in the personal training world as well uh prior to coming to you can um how did kind of that blood sugar crisis manifest itself in clients you were training whether it was pre or post workout, were there things you noticed that you could ascribe to clients who didn't have stable blood sugar? Well, it's just like Dr. Yeckel said, these hunger cues, um, 
from what I saw and not honestly what I've observed with myself, um, and it does vary person to person, of course, but for those affected by that uh, blood sugar crash post workout, here's the thing, if, you, if you're only working out 45 to 60 minutes um, and then you overfeed, you're kind of putting yourself at risk for uh, just kind of that, that energy surplus get, getting kind of drastic, right? Uh, if we're not working out for that long and then, then getting this kind of blood sugar crash, where as Dr. Yeckel said, it's not like we necessarily need the, the energy, but our brain is giving us that signal. Um, you know, I've definitely seen that lead to what's kind of, we kind of call the post-workout munchies, um, right? Or just, just just that kind of boomerang, like overfeeding afterwards. Um, and what that can really do is it, it, it can kind of just slow or stall out or completely stop your results that you're trying to gain, the benefits you're trying to gain from increased activity and improved nutrition status, right? That's that's what it's really doing. So, you know, I know we've said it before, but we can't drive home the point enough that the huge shining star of this of this carbohydrate, it's it's a carbohydrate that helps manage that response. It helps manage the blood sugar response so that you're not getting that. Um, and I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of times we think of carbohydrates doing the opposite. But that's, as Dr. Yuckel said, there's a large spectrum of carbohydrate. And this is one that does not do that and actually can help with that. And, and that really takes us, you know, into the next uh part of the discussion, which is around this whole confusion of carbohydrates. So really wanted to spend a, a bit of time on that blood sugar part of the discussion because, you know, that's really what makes it not be a one size fits all approach. Why you can't characterize all carbohydrates as the same is in part due to their blood sugar response. Um, so, so Kathy, maybe just if you could expand on that, the, the type of carbohydrate, um, where is this confusion coming around? you know, this leading to this fear of carbohydrate and how does the type of carbohydrate kind of impact some of these common things people are afraid of? Now, I think that's a really good question. The A lot of the fear these days is that we've had so much in the way of health messaging against sugary sweetened beverages, against all of what we've said commonly is carbohydrate. And unfortunately, those are the fast acting carbohydrates. And there's who needs that? I mean, there really are very, very few circumstances where we need lots of fast energy. That's 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 is what fast and fast um, appearing carbohydrates do. The, the the glucose, the blood glucose, and so when you have fast acting carbohydrates, when you have slow acting carbohydrates, when you have fiber, most we're talking about. There's only a few classes that are fast acting carbohydrates. That's the simple gluclosis, the simple table sugars. The so it's it isn't we're vilifying a, a, most of the carbohydrates and said whereas really it's just this one portion that we have to be really careful about in our diets. Mm -hmm. And for health purposes, that's very real. But there's all these vegetables and fruits and beans and you know grains and everything that are carbohydrates that are that are terrific and are very healthy for us. Mm -hmm. And fibers too. So it's 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 we vilified one little class just because we've attached this health message to it. And and yes, that's correct. Except that what it's done is it's is it's <laughs> skewed the whole picture away from all the good carbohydrates. And you know, when we talk about a good carbohydrate, like what should we want a carbohydrate to do? What's what's the ideal? For, for most situations, you know, not leaving your your high performance extreme situations where things might differ out of the mix. For, for most situations where people are consuming some type of carbohydrate with the intention of wanting to get, you know, sustained, long lasting energy out of it. What are the characteristics we'd want in a carbohydrate to provide that? Yeah, you want these very complex starches like super starch, but super starch reigns supreme. It's 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 in a class by itself. And that's what's so impressive about it. And it's it's also in from in the nutrition and in the diet, you want those carbohydrates that have lots of the vitamins and minerals so that the quality of the carbohydrate really shines through. Super starch is is the energy form. And so it's giving you the pure energy, but that doesn't mean that it needs to be fast energy. This is this mm. is a scenario that's giving you what our bodies would normally have always had for eons, which is that very, very slow energy so that there doesn't have to be this all hands on deck response by the insulin and by, you know, in terms of the whole body trying to right itself again after a huge surge in glucose. Outside of the, the you know, 
the way it's delivering energy, even when we're talking about thinking of other, um, you know, types of more complex carbohydrates, just could you speak to the practicality of it? You know, so if we buy into this notion of what we're talking about, that these slower, steady releasing carbohydrates are, are the preferred type of carbohydrates we should utilize for energy, um, what advantage or benefit might superstarch provide in an exercise setting, say, over something like a sweet potato or a bowl of lentils, you know, other basically complex carbohydrates from food, you know, why, why is that not necessarily just a clean one-to-one -one switch? I'll just have this bowl of lentils instead of the super starch. One, I think, no, <laughs> I think everybody would agree that that's not exactly what you'd want to eat before you go do some sprints or do any you kind of exercise. You don't want to puree lentils. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody um, else that. <laughs> there is data that suggests that, you know, lentils, those kinds of things eaten a few hours before exercise can definitely benefit performance. There's nothing questionable about that. But the beauty of super starch is that you can have, you can take in super starch 30 minutes before you exercise. I've taken it in 15 minutes before I exercise. And, and and under those conditions, it's not necessarily that you're going to 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 even try to have that energy available for that workout. <laughs> it's more the after part that I would be concerned about. For, but for me, I often have it for say lunch and then work out in the afternoon, run, take my run in the afternoon. So it's coming off so slowly that you, the beauty of it is that you don't have to time it so carefully. But the but the other beauty of it is it is it's it's this slow complex carbohydrate and yet it's easy. <laughs> On the stomach, you don't have to think about like the comparison to lentils is, is to yep. me is always a great one because <laughs> you would never eat that 30 minutes before you run. Or even <laughs> foods that are high in fiber too, right? Yeah, when you're using yeah. that as an example, that's right. probably not something that somebody who's going out for a run is going to want to be putting into their system 30 right. minutes before. So Sure. One of the um, very few times you don't want fiber is right before a workout. <laughs> uh, you know, so this right. takes the guesswork out of it. It really does. You know, it, it, it's one of those things where you you can it, it doesn't really matter so much exactly when you take it because it's just doing its thing in the background <laughs> so let's let's put a little a bit of a bow on this and and kind of summarize what we've been talking about um today and kathy very much appreciate the insight uh here um so in in kind of talking about the benefits again of super starch um and a little of this will be a review but want to make sure that we really drill this home um the very core benefit is what we spent the early part of this podcast talking on, which is the stable blood sugar, you know, so the ability to deliver energy without that big surge. Um, anything, again, you could add to that, Kathy, the, the, the importance of stable blood sugar and avoiding this spike and crash in your glucose? Yeah, I think for most of us, let's face it, um, we have huge populations that are overweight at this point. So stable blood sugar matters. And But even for every athlete, for anyone, it, it matters because it doesn't start to influence how the body is having to perform. The body can decide, the muscles can decide for themselves, for that activity, how they want to do it. So it's working in the background, so benefiting us from its stability um, without dictating what the body should burn at a given time. As opposed to maybe when you're taking in something that is fast acting, it is kind of dictating that you are reliant on these fast acting carbohydrates. Yeah, it's all hands on deck at that point. That if, if you take in a huge load of carbohydrate, fast acting carbohydrate, then your body has to deal with it. And so you're going to try to burn it. You're going to, yeah, it's, it's just, it changes, it completely shifts the focus to burning carbohydrate and that for most exercise you don't necessarily want to do that that kind of takes us to our second point and there's two components of this that i want to talk about the, the long lasting energy so one component is what you guys were just uh, mentioning you know the there's it, it's it just sets you up for a different fueling strategy right when with the super starch versus versus fast acting carbohydrate could you perhaps kind of talk through how one would set you up to fuel more frequently versus one might set you up for a more minimalist strategy of fueling? Yeah, as we said with the fast acting carbohydrates, the, 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 the sequence, the guidelines, you really are for, because of the huge spike and then, it, and then it leaves the system very quickly because you have a big insulin surge, you, you're, the body is forced to use it like that, so, which means that you're constantly having to refuel. So during a marathon, that's why the people are constantly taking in oftentimes the, the sports drinks um, periodically. And you have to time it very carefully because otherwise if you miss the timing, 
your your you can know you can, your performance can really suffer um, because you again you've moved your body toward having to use more of the carbohydrate instead of being more reliant on the fat, which it might at that time have a better ratio that it would like to to use for its fuel. Um, and then, but for for superstars, when it when it comes on, and it's just you know it's it's just leaving you with the stable blood sugar in the background, the muscle can can decide what it's going to do. It's there for a long period of time. It's it can say, okay, I'm going. You're surging. I can burn more glycogen. I can, or I can back it off and I can burn more fat. And it, it has the muscle has the potential to to really make all the adaptations it it needs to for the type of training that you're trying to do. The other component of this um, really comes back to the origins of superstarts. You know, so as we were talking about other um, types of low glycemic carbohydrate sources, you know, the the uniqueness of superstarch isn't just point one that it keeps you stable and it doesn't spike you. You know, there there's other big in, in saying that. I mean, that's part of the uniqueness, but there's other things right that don't spike you and that can keep you stable. With superstarch, it's really how long it's doing that. Um, so, you know, I, I just wanted to point that out and, and maybe there's, there's something else you might add to that, but that really comes back to what it was created for and the patented cooking process that it goes through is that it's providing you this stable blood sugar over a much longer period of time than other things that wouldn't spike you. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and in fact, you know, you mentioned that the, when it was, when it was formulated for this child, this baby and at, at the time, um, that how much they needed to take in. And that was, you know, 90, 120 grams. But in reality, that was in part because it was a baby <laughs> and they needed to be very careful. But with the adults, one of the studies has shown that those adults with the challenge only took in 50 grams and it lasted for seven and a half hours. So I think one of the surprising things that we're going to gradually find as more research is done is the fact that a little bit can last a long time. And although we're so <laughs> we're so used to fueling the way we fuel for, for fast acting, that it that over time I think we're gonna start to titrate and understand better what do we need to take for which types of forms of exercise. And that's you know that's all gonna be in the research. Um, but it's very exciting because when you have stability in the background, your body can, you know, you can train your body to the fullest potential in my mind. Mm. The last one, um, that was really well said, Kathy, I think tying those two thoughts together, um, that was, that was a, a good way to summarize it. Um, the last point, um, which, which is related, but sort of taking us a little bit away from the energy component of it is the high fat burning potential with super starch. And, and this, you know, comes from the relationship between super starch and its impact on blood sugar and thus it's low impact on insulin. Um, but how should we think about, you know, the environment which super starch creates to allow you to burn fat. How, how should folks think about that, and, and what what makes that unique about super starch? Again, it's almost it's 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 the closest you can get to fasting in my mind because you're just keeping you're just keeping blood sugar stable, which means that the body doesn't have to say, oh wait a minute, I've just taken in a whole bunch of fast acting carbs, so I have to use those, and so. You're burning them even if you don't want to be burning them because you 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 want to you you were taking them in to to try to keep things stable to begin with so you're working against yourself, but the biggest problem with the fast acting carbs is that you you really spike insulin, and some of us can do that some of us can't do that but in the end, insulin it, it, our fat tissue is very 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 sensitive to the insulin and so the minute you spike insulin it means that your fat cells sort of shut down they they're they're designed not to compete with the glucose let's put it that way and so if you can just keep blood sugar stable what happens is that you can you can keep burning fat you can you because the muscle has the delivery of the fatty acids it doesn't get impeded there's no competing substrate really um, for fuel, so it, it it all works sort of copacetically with the with in the context of what it wants to burn instead of what you're dictating um, as if as if we should know <laughs> <laughs> the body's master plan for us. Yeah, no. don't believe everything you think. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I want to thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kathy Eckel, for your your time today. Uh, before we sign off, um, anything else you wanted to add? Anything we didn't cover, uh, we didn't hit on, or, or anything else you'd like to to say as as part of this discussion? 
Yeah, I, th I really appreciate being here today. I've been, a, um, for the audience, I've been an advisor for the UCAN company for, for a number of years now. And I just think it's a really, it's a fantastic revolutionary product. And I think it can help all sorts of individuals with health as well as with their exercise goals. So to me, it's, it's one of the, yeah, I think I, I just, there are a few things that come around that are so new and so exciting. And this is very new and exciting and it's, it's fun to be part of it. Thank you. I can't tell you how appreciative we are of you making all of us a little bit smarter here at UCAN. Everybody that's tuning into this a little bit smarter. So just want to thank you so much again for your time, Kathy. Natalie, thanks so much, thank you so much for Dr. being Campbell. with us. Yep. Uh, thanks for everybody in the audience for joining us. Check out generationucan.com to learn more and we will see you next time. Take care. <laughs>